And here we are with Glenn Weil. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to welcome him uh, as part of his uh, tour with his uh, new book, Radical Markets. Uh, Glenn is um, certainly one of the most uh, innovative economists of his generation. Uh, and this book is testament to that, um, uh, that assessment that has developed of him because it is a very innovative book about uh, ideas in economics and uh, the broader political economy. Um, very briefly, Glenn is um, a principal researcher at uh, Microsoft, but he's also the founder and chairman of Radical Exchange, which is something he started telling me about uh, earlier uh, this evening, and uh, I expect will be part of the conversation uh, that uh, we'll have uh, later today. Um, Glenn is, uh, there are many things to say about Glenn and his uh, very, very impressive CV. Uh, the one uh, snippet that I really like is the fact that he uh, completed his PhD in economics at Princeton in one year. Uh, which is uh, quite remarkable, but uh, so there you go. And uh, just some, uh, adi an, adi an additional line uh, for Glenn CV, just hot off the press. Glenn uh, was named uh, today by Bloomberg Magazine as one of the 50 people in the world to watch for the future of business. Uh, so here we are with Glenn Weil. Glenn, you've got about 30 minutes to take us through Thanks radical markets, much. and then we'll do some Q&A. Great, great. Thank you so much. So. Um, this is a book with Eric Posner, and uh, Eric Posner and I have a bit different personality type. So uh, Eric is a very sort of door technocrat. He uh, is really into very detailed policy analysis. And there's a lot of quite detailed policy ideas in this book. But um, when I was 10 years old, I had three tricolor hair. And I uh, um, was like a socialist activist. And by the age of 15, I was an Ayn Rand follower and a uh, leader of a national teenage Republican organization. Um, so uh, ever since then, I've been trying to fuse those ideas. And uh, this is my latest iteration of that. So I would ask that uh, let's put aside the details of policy for a moment. And, I'd ask you to come with me on a journey of imagination uh, as if you were you know, going into science fiction a bit. Suspend your disbeliefs and come uh, visit Marketopia. So Marketopia uh, is a city defined by the fact that all of the major private property, the buildings and the land, the airplanes and the trucks, the factories and the intellectual property are all continually up for bid to the highest bidder who's allowed to possess these assets as long as she satisfies two conditions. First, she stands ready to sell the asset to anyone who comes along and it beats her bid. And second, she pays that highest bid as a monthly rental payment into a common pool of resources. And while this idea in Marketopia excludes things like pets or family heirlooms, it does uh, include things we would usually think of as collective decisions. For example, Marketopia has for many years been part of the market union and is considering whether to leave or not. And uh, it's going to hold a referendum on this. But the way that it's going to do it is not by uh, auctioning it to the highest bidder or by giving everyone one vote, but instead by having everyone say how much they'd be willing to pay to see uh, them stay in or exit. And whatever has the total highest willingness to pay will be selected. And all the funds that are raised in this process are continually returned to the citizens of Marketopia in an egalitarian fashion, either as they do in Norway through the provision of public goods with their oil, or as they do in Alaska by sending every citizen a check. Um, now, uh, when you first hear about Marketopia, probably your first reaction is that this is the most extreme version of a free market you can possibly imagine. Something that even Adam Smith couldn't have come up with in a fever dream. Because um, most of the things in our society, you know, the UK is supposed to be this super free market place, right? But most things are not actually available for competitive bidding. If I wanted to take this building and throw out all the stodgy bureaucrats who work here um, and it, turn it into a dynamic startup hub, um, I would have to negotiate with some crusty old guy like Kardec. Um, and uh, he'd probably realize that I had a really creative thing in mind and try to charge me an arm and a leg uh, for this place. 
Um, and after years of fighting with him, maybe eventually I'd get hold of it, or maybe it would all fall apart. Um, so very little in our society is actually like a stock market where there's a going competitive price for things. Whereas in Marketopia, by the very rules of the system, sort of every major asset is like that. So that might sound intriguing. It might challenge your assumptions about the society we live in, but it probably doesn't sound appealing. It probably sounds like in that world, the wealthy would dominate everyone. They would be able to outbid everyone for bit, you know, in the bidding process. They'd control all the assets and they'd tyrannize over everyone else. But then you have to ask yourself, who do you mean by the wealthy exactly, right? I mean, wealthy is the adjective form of wealth. And wealth, what is that? That's stocks and bonds and land and railroads and things like this. And in Marketopia, no private citizen owns any of those things. In fact, the value that comes from them is equally distributed by the very rules of the system to every citizen. And every citizen has an equal right to use that value to contest for control of the assets. In that sense, Marketopia is actually a more extreme form of common ownership than is any of the uh, communist systems that this 200-year-old guy ever actually managed to inspire, which inevitably degenerated into the control by a narrow bureaucratic elite that was far more iron than the capitalist oppressors that he claimed to be replacing. So that's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? How can something simultaneously be the most extreme form of socialism and the most extreme form of a free market? I thought like the whole point of modern politics was that those were opposites, the free market and socialism. And yet the notion that actually to have a truly free market, you have to have common ownership of most assets. And that in order to have true socialism, you need it to run it through decentralized market mechanisms. That was actually not just a possibility, but a dogma in late 19th century political economy, the field from which economics, political science, sociology, probably most of the things that people in this room study grew. It was a fundamental doctrine for people like William Stanley Jevons and Leon Walras, who were the founders of what's called the marginal revolution, which is the basis of all the economics that you study. And it was most closely associated with this guy here. Now, can anyone who has not read the book tell me who this guy is? Henry George? Yes, very good. Who else knew that that was Henry George? Raise your hand. So one person. Now, how many people recognize this guy when I put him up? Good number. How many people recognize the guy on the left when I put him up? <laughs> Most of you? OK. This guy, Henry George, outsold those other two put together by a factor of three. He was the best-selling author in the English language other than the Bible for 30 years. He was the principal inspiration for the political career of two of the most distinguished statesmen in British history. Does anyone know? Winston Churchill and David Lloyd George. Winston Churchill cut his teeth as a populist Georgist speechmaker uh, in the British countryside. Um, and uh, he inspired the Chinese revolution against the Qin dynasty, much as Marx inspired the Russian one against the Romanovs. So he's this enormously intellectual, influential figure. But his ideas of socialism through free markets were not really consistent with the rhetoric that came to dominate during the Cold War. And so he receded to a large extent from the public mind. And in fact, even Winston Churchill, who was once this fire-breathing Georgist, became a conservative defender of capitalism uh, in the Cold War period. So um, luckily, though, George's ideas were not entirely forgotten. They actually continued to develop within the economics academy into a field called mechanism design, led by a guy named William Vickery. And Vickery sought to take George's ideas and to turn them into a blueprint for addressing what he saw as the great failures of capitalism, the lack of public goods, the market power of large corporations, and the inequality that it created. 
unfortunately, um, Vickery was a little bit of a nebbish. We, in the book, we compare him to Master Yoda. He was very sort of silly and would speak in ways most people didn't understand, didn't publish most of his papers. Um, in fact, he was largely responsible for uh, the idea of the veil of ignorance that probably many of you learned about. He published that in 1945, um, but only about, I think, a few dozen people in the world are even aware of that. Um, so, uh, and Vickery, um, because he was so reclusive, these ideas never really got out there. In fact, the way that mechanism design ended up being used, it became a major field and he won the Nobel Prize for it. But it was used by Facebook and Google to sell ads, not to address inequality, maybe even made inequality worse for those reasons. And uh, when he wasn't very happy about this, Vickery, and when he won the Nobel Prize, he decided finally his moment in the sun had come, he was gonna bring these ideas to a broader audience. And then he died two days later. So, so the um, goal uh, of this book is to try to revive that vision and to turn Vickery and George's dream into a program for social transformation to address the big picture problems of inequality, low productivity, and social conflict that we're facing today. And we do this through five uh, detailed proposals, which I can only go over very superficially right now. The first is an instantiation of this auction idea for private property called the Common Ownership Self-Assessed Tax, in which every owner of significant private assets, mostly businesses, but also individuals, would self-assess the value of their assets, pay a tax, depending on the asset class, of about 7% on that asset, and have to stand ready to sell that asset to anyone who comes along to buy it at that self-assessed price. Um, this uh, tax, while it would differ across different assets, would be on average about 7%. It would therefore raise enough revenue, even if everything else stayed fixed and everyone evaluated everything at current market prices, to pay the typical family of four, even after eliminating all other capital taxes and paying off the national debt, a 20,000 pound a year social dividend. Um, at the same time, we estimate that it would actually increase the value of assets by about a factor of three because it would allow things to be far more fluidly reallocated to their best uses, encouraging much more innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and if that's true, it would actually end up paying something more like 100,000 pound a year social dividend to every citizen, every family of four. So let me give you an illustration of how this would make things so much more liquid and free flowing. So uh, this is a depiction of the United States radio spectrum. Now, um, most of the radio spectrum is used uh, currently for over the air broadcast. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you have listened to an over, watched an over the air television broadcast in the last month? Raise your hand. One person, two people, three people. How many people have listened to an over-the-air radio broadcast in the last month? About half. How many people have used Wi-Fi or 5, 4G LTE internet services over the last month? Almost everyone, yes. So, um, and yet, the vast majority of the spectrum is used for the first purposes, not the second. Why is that? Well, the spectrum was, in the United States and the UK, basically perpetually auctioned off in these fragmented chunks that aren't any good for those new purposes to a bunch of now incumbent over the air broadcasters. And if you wanna buy it up, you have to go and negotiate with all these colorful people here in order to try to reassemble it. Things would be quite different under the system I'm proposing. So imagine the Q91.5 um, radio station owns this pink block here. They'd have to post a price for it, say $20 million. Now they could adjust that up to $30 million if they wanted at any time, but they'd have to pay a 7%, let's say, tax rate on the average value that it had. So if it, for six months it was at 20 million, six months at $30 million, they'd have a tax liability of one and three quarter million dollars. But the really interesting thing from the perspective of an entrepreneur is that's not just true of them. Every one of these little chunks of spectrum would have a price on it. So you could just go into an app, you could circle any set of these things, and the app would just tell you what it costs. So if Verizon comes in and says, 
that looks good for me. This looks a bit expensive over here. Let me not do that. Let me try these. It would see that's $82.3 million. Well, maybe that's good. I'll buy that up. And I need this chunk for my new Wi-Fi service. But this part, who needs it? I'll put it back on the market at $5 million. So that shows you the sort of free-flowing entrepreneurship that this system would allow. And at the same time, it generates a huge amount of revenue for public projects um, and uh, equalizing social dividends. So that's the first chapter of the book. The second chapter proposes a new system of voting in which every citizen would have the ability to defend their own interests, even if they're parts of minorities, rather than relying on judges, political leaders, bureaucrats to defend their interests. Um, and that system uh, involves giving every citizen an equal budget of voice credits that they're allowed to use to weigh in on, in, on and against candidates and issues that matter the most to them. And um, these uh, uh, citizens might have an incentive to put all their votes on one issue that they care most about, leading to extremist behavior. But what the system does to counter that is that it becomes increasingly expensive to have more influence on one issue. The cost of votes is actually the square of the number of votes you buy on any given candidate or issue. So let me give you a visual illustration of that. So imagine you have 100 credits. Um, and imagine we're against the immediate deportation of all illegals in the United States. So we put one vote against that. That cost us one credit. But now, let's say we're really against the sharp reduction of federal programs for the poor. So we put several, oh, wow, that's really going down fast, right? What about if we're in favor of a rise in the minimum wage? That goes down very slowly. Why? Because we had a lot of votes on this, so it's really expensive. But we only had one vote on this, so it was very cheap. So that's the quadratic voting system. Um, the third idea is a new system of migration, which draws on some insights they have in the Canadian migration system, where individuals and communities are allowed to sponsor migrants rather than just big corporations and governments. And we expand on that system to shift the economics associated with migration. So the idea is that right now, almost all the benefits of migration accrue to wealthy employers and to the migrants themselves. In our system, because communities and individuals could sponsor migrants, and those migrants could compensate those communities for taking on the risk of something going wrong and them being responsible and so forth, the migrants could offer them financial compensation. Because there are so many gains from migration, that would end up meaning, potentially, if, as we proposed, there was one migrant for every citizen, which is obviously a dramatic expansion of migration, it could mean a 20,000 pound a year, again, social or earning for every family of four. Um, so this would dramatically reduce inequality within wealthy countries, but at the same time, it would build political support to dramatically expand migration, thereby dramatically reducing global inequality. Fourth, we argue that competition policy has to be at the center of what it means to have a market economy. You can't have a market economy without competition any more than you can have a democracy in a one-party state. And yet, um, we argue that competition has not really been tried. What do we mean by that? We argue that about 90% of the market power that exists in contemporary economies, especially in the US and the UK, is completely ignored by existing antitrust enforcement. First, there are four or five large investors, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, that control about a quarter of the whole corporate economy. They are four of the five largest investors in almost every publicly traded firm. And because they're diversified across these firms, they have no interest in seeing them compete for consumers for workers, or in the political process, as they used to. 
This is perhaps the most iron monopoly that has ever existed. It's the only thing I think we've ever seen in capitalism that really comes close to Marx's vision of the capitalists conspiring to systematically expropriate the workers. And yet, there are simple fixes to this, and antitrust has done nothing on this. Second, we argue that, as anyone who's ever worked a job knows, your employer has far more power over you than the people who sell products to you do. And yet, antitrust has completely ignored, in its enforcement, the power that companies gain through mergers and other actions over workers, and is focused exclusively on the power that they have over consumers. Um, and again, there are simple things that could be done to fix this. Really, it requires just treating symmetrically labor markets and product markets. Finally, we argue that the data that each of us um, produce every day is the fuel for the machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms that drive Facebook, Google, and all of the claims that your jobs are going to be automated in the future. But if it's our data that is training these algorithms, then what's happening is not the replacement of people by machines, but of paid labor by unpaid labor. In fact, there's an interesting story, which is that when the television, when the movie camera was first invented, Thomas Edison uh, got a patent on recording people going about their business on the streets. And he went around saying, this is artificial acting. We don't need actors anymore because we have the camera. And all the rents went to him and his production companies, and none went to the people that he was videotaping. Now, a brilliant French filmmaker decided, hmm, maybe I can record actors doing things. And maybe that will actually be better, because well, I'll have to pay them something, and then maybe we'll have the unions representing them, and I'll have to give them credit. Maybe they'll actually do a better job if you give them some agency in what they're doing. They could actually develop careers of being an actor and become experts in it. And I think what we're getting right now is this sort of low quality artificial intelligence and slow productivity growth that result from us having bad data that we get because we're trying to fool people and lie to them. And instead, what we need to do is organize collectively into a data labor movement that demands a fair share of the rents from the digital economy. Now, these are all very radical ideas. They're not things we would advocate implementing overnight. And in fact, in every chapter, we give very incremental ways in which both entrepreneurs and policymakers can experiment with these ideas. And they're being widely taken up, as I'll talk about in a moment. But we portray this as a broader ideology because we think this is something the world desperately needs right now. People are really concerned about the increasing consolidation of power into a few tech platforms and financial elites. And the reactions that we're getting to that are from people who want to further centralize power into some ethno-national state or into the hands of a all-powerful central government. And our popular culture isn't offering us much of substance in response. But nonetheless, there are thinkers out there and leaders who are desperately looking for a liberal, market-driven way to address these problems of inequality and productivity that are driving this populist wave. There are people like Kwame Anthony Appiah, an old mentor of mine, who argues that we need a liberal, diverse, open, malleable society, but one that allows us to live in communities and identities and to coordinate. You have people like Vitalik Buterin, founder of Ethereum, the second largest cryptocurrency, who is desperately trying to build a more decentralized world. And Tim Berners-Lee here at Oxford is doing the same thing. You have people like Zanny Minton Beddoes, editor-in-chief of The Economist, who about three months ago published a manifesto that adopted much of the rhetoric of the book uh, and many of its proposals, actually. And in fact, they named it one of their books of the year uh, just last week. And uh, politics always moves slower. But Margarete Vesteyer in the European Union, who's likely to become the new 
uh, head of the European Union, is, um, comes from a party called the Social or the Radicale Venstre Party in Denmark, which was founded on the principles of Henry George and has been trying to uh, use market mechanisms as a means to restore legitimacy to liberalism. So I think because so many are looking for this, there's been a huge amount of enthusiasm about the ideas in the book, which really make a first pretty comprehensive attempt, I think, to supply that. Um, and it's turned into this social movement called Radical Exchange, uh, which is going to have a conference in Detroit in March 2019, and has four tracks to it, ideas and research, entrepreneurship and technology, arts and communications, and activism and government. And I've tried to give a little artifact of each of these here. So our ideas and research track brings in academics to contribute these sorts of market mechanisms, but not just from an economic perspective, because economics is not enough. In fact, our ideas and research team is led by a post-colonial anarcho-syndicalist historian at Georgetown University who is writing about how um, interpreting things not in terms of states and markets, but in terms of the shifting of monopoly power over time helps us understand the history of empires much better. Um, there's, there's a huge amount of investment, about 10 billion according to our estimates, in technology and entrepreneurship in this space. And in fact, here's a little quantitative representation of this. This is a sentiment analysis of all the discussions going on within the blockchain community. And this little bit here you can see is radical markets. So according to this analysis, it's about one-fifth of the total discussions going on within the blockchain community at the end of 2018. Um, there are all sorts of really interesting artistic projects around this. Um, so there are uh, virtual reality uh, simulations. There are board games. Uh, there are science fiction stories being written. And oops, that's the wrong one. Uh, and probably most entertaining of all, there was a song sung by the 3,000 people at the largest blockchain conference in the world uh, at its opening about the book. So I'll play that song. for you. Uh, these are the song of the day backup singers. This is my song of the day today. So that's what's going on. We're going to sing the chorus one more time, and then we're going to go straight into the song. You ready? One, two, three. B-Y-D-L, Casper's not a serenity, a new way to go. Radical markets are calling to you. Don't I see you when there's work to do? You gotta be you. <laughs> and uh, most exciting of all for me, there are local groups around this thing starting all over the world. In just the last month, about 60 groups have started. There's about 10 or so new every week. And I hope some of you here will be interested in getting engaged, whether it's starting a group here at Oxford, whether it's um, uh, contributing something to the conference, getting involved with the foundation. I think there's really an opportunity here to present a vision that addresses the big picture problems of the world, but that embraces diversity, openness, markets, and liberalism rather than running away from them. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn, for that fascinating tour of the book. Uh, quite remarkable how you did that so quickly, because it is actually um, a, very, um, a very thorough book for those of you who haven't read it. Um, so we're going to take questions in a moment. Uh, because we're streaming this on YouTube, uh, wait, do wait for the, um, uh, the, the mic to come to you. I'll call on you. You just introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, and then ask your question. Uh, and while you prepare uh, to ask uh, these questions, let, uh, let me kick it off, Glenn. Please, Karen. And, um, uh, you know, so we're a school of government. In addition to focusing on policy, uh, we focus on management. And one of the big issues that our students grapple with is the management of change. Uh, and what you're proposing is pretty damn radical. So, um, and I know you've given us some sense to start thinking about this through radical exchange, which yeah. is probably the, the bit of the book that um, intrigued me the most. I mean, obviously, yeah. there are lots of great ideas here. But what do you see as the big implementation barriers? And what are you starting to see as the most inspiring mechanisms for change uh, as you're engaging in this part of the journey now? So I think that um, the biggest area, barrier to adoption of an idea like this 
is people's senses of legitimacy. It's not about getting a policymaker to press a button. It's about getting people to reconceptualize democracy and capitalism. And so the things that excite me most, even in the entrepreneurial space, are the ones that can most strike people's imagination. One of my favorite examples of this is there's something called a million dollar homepage. I don't know if anyone has ever seen this, but it's a collaborative art project where they auction off pixels uh, on a screen and people color them in with whatever color they want and it turns into art, except it usually turns into chaos, right? <laughs> because private property sucks as a way to do things collectively, right? And uh, so one thing that is, is launching soon is they're trying to use these principles to have an alternative to private property that doesn't a collaborative art project like that. So you'll literally be able to see in real time just how much better a social liberal model like we're proposing work, a radical liberal model works as compared to an individualistic liberal model. Right. So is that gonna move stock markets? Is that gonna make people uh, Bitcoin billionaires? No. But I think what it is going to do is make people wake up to how the institutions that they're used to make no sense hmm. uh, and how we could design a better future. And it's pro pro projects like that that really excite me and this grassroots activism that we're seeing, the way in which we're literally getting together. My head of activism in government is a George Mason University PhD libertarian uh, charter city advocate. And Ananya is an anarcho-syndicalist post-colonial historian. And, uh, and then we've got you know, shades of things in between. Uh, we've got two-thirds or three-quarters women in our senior leadership. We have people from every uh, continent other than Antarctica in the world right now. And maybe we'll get Antarctica local too going. Uh, and um, the diversity, the openness, the community that it's building, uh, and the fact that we finally have a real movement around liberal ideas, I find that incredibly exciting. Fantastic, great. Um, so let's start taking some questions from the group. Um, so raise your hand so that I can uh, see you. So we've got our first question here from uh, uh, Anandi. Uh, so Jolie, could you, yeah. Hi, I haven't yet read the book, but I am very, very intrigued. Uh, I guess I was, th as you were conceiving of the book, you know, I'm. I'm yeah. I'm a bit of a nerd, maybe, in the way I'm thinking about this. But so I'm one step behind what Karthik was talking about yeah. in terms of implementation. But have you tried sort of doing uh, versions of this as an online experiment or a, you know, a lab-style experiment? Yeah. Because it seems to be the sort of thing that which might be amenable to that kind of, uh, to see how things play out. Yeah. I mean, we, we did a large-scale survey using that tool that I put up with quadratic voting with about 5,000 people. But it was done more as if it was a survey. So it was a little bit closer to a field experiment than a lab experiment. But there have also been lab experiments with quadratic voting and, and as well as with the common ownership self-assessed tax. But there's also been things much more fun than that. So the best one of them is the common ownership self-assessed tax actually has been discovered by many people and rediscovered by many people, including by a Hungarian economist under communism who turned it into a Burning Man style summer camp that's been operating for the last 50 years, 15 years, that you can look up online called Liska Land, and it shows lots of people enjoying themselves at the summer camp where all the property is owned under this sort of regime. So there's been a number of interesting experiments. Yeah, but I guess I was also thinking about the combination of them, right? Because yeah. what you're talking about is the individual pieces. Yeah. But really, when you're talking about each of these chapters, you, you want it sort of to collectively. Well, that, sound, that sounds interesting, but that sounds more like a virtual world to me rather than, a, rather than a standard experiment necessarily. But there's lots of people doing that. So there's right now a virtual reality simulation of life on Mars where all these things get combined together. Okay. So that, that should be an interesting experience for people to explore. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, we've got a question there from Casper. Casper. Yeah, so I actually think in environmental issues are one of the most interesting areas for this, but they relate to a proposal that's not in the book but evolved after it. So there's something called liberal radicalism that we developed afterwards with Vitalik Buterin and a philosopher economist at Harvard, uh, Zoe Hitzig. Uh, 
um, which uh, basically it goes beyond quadratic voting, which assumes a fixed polity and a fixed set of issues, to allow public good providing communities to emerge without the necessity for a state or a um, corporation or something like that to be managing the process. And I think that's really exciting because I think one of the fundamental reasons why we have so many environmental issues, and climate change is just the most extreme example of this, is that the national boundaries and states that we've established don't respect the environmental features that actually define the physical world we live in. So, you know, rivers almost always cut across countries, and yet there's nation states that are managing the process and fighting with each other over it. But if instead of having so much emphasis on the nation states, if more public goods could be provided in ways that just emerged around the people who were affected by that river, I think you would have a much more coherent framework for trying to deal with environmental issues. OK. Um, there was a hand uh, of, yeah, in the back there. Thanks. Um, so, uh, first of all, I think that this world will be more dynamic and greater dynamism can be disruptive. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, the problem that we have is that we've allowed hoarding of the opportunities that are the other side of that dynamism. Look, China has higher turnover of jobs than any place in the West does. But because people have new opportunities to find, people embrace change and technology and find new sources of meaning that we don't have those opportunities. Those opportunities are hoarded by a small elite in the countries that we live in. And there were times when that wasn't true. We've allowed so much power to accumulate into so few hands over the labor market. We've allowed, um, in the tech sector, all the rents to flow to a small group of people managing that process. So I think that if we can restore the dynamism to the way in which people compete for laborers and not just dynamism to the way in which entrepreneurs are able to benefit, then we'll rebalance the weight of those opportunities. You know, you don't see people who are in, uh, uh, you know, desired professions in London going crazy when a job goes up or goes down because they know they have new opportunities. It's the people who are left behind by that process who are upset, and they should be upset. Um, but I think the solution is to share the benefits of the dynamism with them rather than to clamp down on it. OK, there was a question here. Yeah. Uh, just wait for the mic, yeah. Uh, hello, Yuri Yerich, PhD student here. Uh, thank you for a very thought-provoking uh, speech. I really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward uh, to reading the book. Uh, following up uh, on your idea of uh, private property uh, and extending it to debt, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts uh, to which extent uh, private property at debt as the main causes of economic crisis would, could be avoided uh, in radical yeah. markets. That's and a, if I was great, to great interpolate idea. correctly from your account, there wouldn't be any economic crisis, which w w would certainly be a, a positive development, but yeah. how would you justify it? Well, I I'm not as confident about that because I'm not a macroeconomist. But I, I would agree that most debt would disappear in this world. Because basically what would happen is the value of all assets would fall by about 2 thirds. And so what's currently a down payment would end up being the whole value of the asset, more or less. And so debt burdens would become far, far lower. And I do agree that debt is probably central to the mechanisms that cause financial crises, though I don't know we're completely certain about that. So I think it's something that requires a lot more study, but I do think there is a hope here that much of the economic cycle is actually a result of financial kludges that you need to make capitalism work. And if you can move beyond capitalism to a system, you have a much more fundamental solution to the cycle 
than something like Keynes did, which just patched over the problems of capitalism. That's what Henry George certainly thought would happen in this sort of a world, but I'm not, I, I, I don't understand what actually causes crises in the current system well enough to be confident that the system would solve them, but I think it's a very interesting issue to look at. Fantastic. Okay, we have a question back here, yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed uh, the talk. I have Thanks. one question. Uh, my name is Tanya Martin. I am a Londoner, but currently living in Spain. You mentioned that it is our data that drives the algorithms. And um, you talked about a data labor movement. Can yeah. you give me your vision of that? Yeah. Well, so my, the thought is that, um, and, and, and I put an emphasis on the economic here, because that's where the book started, but it's beyond the economic. The fundamental problem with our current digital economy is that there are basically these giant platforms that control a huge fraction of our attention, and then there's a bunch of isolated individuals. And all the intermediate institutions, the newspapers, the, uh, the stores, uh, to a large extent the universities, uh, the unions, all these things have been sort of eviscerated by technology. And there needs to be dynamism. Those things need to turn over. But new intermediate organizations need to come up in their place. Because otherwise, you'll end up with totalitarianism in the form of these platforms. And so our goal is to try to, around the structures that are relevant to the current economy, around the people who are together providing the data for an algorithm, form new alliances that are done over the web, that are based on solidarity formed through digital means using um, like VPNs that can cut off data access if a website doesn't uh, cooperate. And if you don't think that's possible, look at the Brave Internet Browser, which basically has done a really amazing job of helping extract the rents that advertising websites are getting and redirect them to websites that people actually like. So in, in, in the collective, people do have bargaining power against these firms. And um, I think that Technology, while it fragments us, also gives us more powerful ways to unite with people we would never meet. And so if we can harness that, I think that there's really a capacity there to form a new web of data labor unions that actually cut across states. And that states can empower these things, but actually won't be in charge, which I think is actually for the better. Because as we know, as we've seen, states can go one way or another uh, and they are going one way or another, and I don't think we want them to be the primary source of a solution to the current imbalance of power. So I want to pick up, Glenn, on a couple of points that have already come yeah. up, and they, these sort of reflect some of the, I suppose, um, concerns I yeah. had um, with the book. Um, and, and the first is very much this point about identity that was raised earlier, and yeah. how much of our identity and self-worth is tied into um, existing sources of employment or so sources of wealth or assets yeah. and you know a lot of human happiness is derived from the things we own or we think we own yeah. and uh, and and so what you propose I mean you know in, in your defense you do have the word radical yeah. in the book uh, in the title of the book but what you propose is pretty transformational yeah. to the way we would live our lives and yeah. right and and, and some could argue um, not consistent with um, what, how, how we've come to define happiness in a liberal society. Yeah. So how would you respond to that concern? Well, I think fundamentally, to me, what liberalism means is a political attitude that's opposed to hierarchical, arbitrary, centralized, concentrated, historically derived authorities, and in favor of some sort of dynamic, emergent, notion of culture and identity. And that's fundamentally what I want to achieve, and I think that that's very much possible. Most people in this room probably have quite an exposure to that, that if you actually have the chance to form new communities, if you're not excluded from you know, progress, people love the past that they come from, and they evolve them. You know, I wear a Magen David as a mark of my Jewish faith, but what my Jewish faith means to me is very different than what it means to an ultra-Orthodox Jew or to many of the people who currently identify with the state of Israel, which itself is a very new thing. So those new, emergent, evolving forms of identity is what I think we want to foster. 
And why, where I, why I think people get scared is because they're used to an extremely individualistic, isolated vision of capitalism that fundamentally undermines collective organization. And so when they hear about dynamism, they hear monopolies and isolation. But if we can give them a new vision, a collective vision, a social liberal vision, which is what I think they have very much in Scandinavia, I think people will embrace that dynamism because it will give them more of the freedom to form the communities that they want to form and that are meaningful to them rather than locking them in to fixed racial and state-based uh, identities. But people are fundamentally afraid of change, Glenn. That's, you know, when we think, when we study change management and we study about how organizations try to, you know, reinvent themselves, reimagine themselves in the face of competitive forces, the, the source of inertia is fear driven from the fact that people are afraid of uh, the, the very dynamism that you're talking about. And so it's, so, so I guess part of the, 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 the um, uh, alternative that you might have to cope with is that in a liberal society, the liberal choice, the democratic choice, the, the plural choice, might even under a system of quadratic yeah. voting, might still well be a system that preserves the status quo because it's you know there's a sense of comfort and a sense of uh, um, uh, just a deep-seated sense of uh, happiness that is derived from uh, the familiarity of one's settings and surroundings. I mean, I, I think as an empirical matter, I don't uh -huh. think that that's true in societies that are really dynamically reallocating the benefits to a broad-based set of people. You look at Singapore, there's a huge amount of comfort with change in Singapore. Actually, until about very recently, when things have started slowing down. And I think that there's a, there was a huge amount of comfort with change in the United States during the 40s through the 70s. And the time when people fright, freeze up is when they hear change but what they see is I'm getting screwed and a few people are getting all the benefits when change is a lie. And I think, you know, you look at people who are in the elite, people in this room mostly, we're not afraid of change, but I don't think that that is because we're just so educated or so smart. It's because we have a realistic prospect of getting most of the benefits of that change and everybody else gets the short end of the stick. So I don't think that this is rocket science. I think there's lots of experience, and you see the same thing in China. In places where there are, there's rapid, widely shared prosperity, you see a lot of openness. And in places that are um, stagnating and a few people are grabbing more and more of the pie, you see a lot of closeness. So we need to change the distribution of opportunities to open people to the value of this. Okay, fantastic. We've got a question here. Hi, I'm Danny, and I'm a uh, PhD student here as well. Um, in your, uh, so much of what politics does in our contemporary society is negotiate the, uh, the ownership, in many ways, of benefits that uh, accrue to various citizens yeah. in various ways. In a system like yours, what is the purpose of your state? Right, we have a voting system, but in a system where everything is up for grabs all the time, and essentially you probably just need an exchange yeah. to kind of run this, what, what exactly would your hypothesized state do? Um, well, first of all, I don't hypothesize necessarily there would be a state in the world that I'm describing. Uh, but on the other hand, I, and in fact, I don't think a state really exists in our current world either exactly. Because the truth is, what do you mean by the state? There's all sorts of different organizations. There's corporations. Like, when people say the state, I say, oh, you mean Facebook? That's a much more powerful organization than any nation state is. Do you mean Google is the state? Is that what you mean? Um, so look, there are many different organizations. And in my world, I actually imagine that most assets would not be owned by, quote, individuals, unquote. Most assets would be owned by a variety of different emergent polities, which would manage the asset in the interest of all the people who benefit from the way in which that asset is being used. And so you would have what Daniel Allen, a philosopher that I've been working with, has described as polypolitanism, where rather than having states, you would have 
a diverse range of effectively global civil society organizations at different levels of resolution, and not all geographically organized, that would own and operate these assets for the benefits of all the people who benefit from the public goods that they provide. And that might sound wild. You know, don't they have to maximize the return on capital? Well, not if you have a principle of public good provision rather than a principle of private ownership. So let me, let me pick up uh, on, on that point, Glenn, because this comes back to this issue of quadratic voting. Yeah. Who gets to set the agenda uh, in, on what gets put on the ballot? Well, in the, in the short version of it, uh, it emerges from the citizens' demands themselves. So the citizens, uh, in order to get something on the ballot, have to get a certain number of effectively signatures, except in a quadratic sense. And if it passes the threshold, it gets on the ballot. But I think eventually it wouldn't even be that. The, the polities would emerge. They would just emerge from the contributions that citizens make to create organizations. And in that process of forming the polity, they would select a process for selecting the, you know, that would be part of the pitch of the organization, basically. OK. OK. We've got a question in the back there. Yeah. yeah. The um, problem with kind of most proposals for sort of uh, socialism, it's interesting that you don't use that word a lot in the book, and I wonder if there's a kind of whether socialism. Oh, that's just because Eric doesn't in. like the word socialism, okay. but I like the word <laughs> socialism. Um, <laughs> so, how do you imagine the transition? Because that seems to yeah. be the biggest thing. Do you do you cherry pick these and try and implement them? How does that work? Yeah. So, uh, a change like this has to come about if it's to work, not by being imposed from the top down but rather by emerging from changes in people's notions of legitimacy. And that will happen through entrepreneurs experimenting with this and it coming to be a part of all sorts of services that people use. It will come from artists writing science fiction books and people ideas being triggered. It will come from novels and films. It'll come from people organizing political communities that change the nature of cleavages within society and create alliances across people around these type of topics. So all of those things have to happen in communication with each other. Um, anything that tries to impose this on a big scale from the top down will defeat the very purpose, I think. OK, we've got a question up front here, probably. Uh, why don't we just take a couple of questions, and then maybe we can see if there's a theme okay, running Jay through Bowser. My question really is the opposite of what some of the others have been is yeah. how do you get from here to there yeah. but the there if you handle your system yeah. up and running do you see it as a would there be a steady state equilibrium yeah. um, which is likely to last or what would keep it in, in place rather than and yeah. would it be some end of history or would it be open to a challenge from some group which is emergent and uh, take back control for themselves or yeah. for their people. Well, so let, let's yeah, just take yeah, a couple sorry, of other yeah. questions. Oh, there's one right there, Jolie. Yeah. Just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, John. I'm a PhD student. Uh -huh. um, so how would this process of kind of instantaneous purchase work? Because I can imagine there being situations where people just wouldn't want to sell for potentially very reasonable uh, reasons. Like say uh, you're raising a family, your kids are about to do exams, and then this corporation that's next door decides they want to buy up your house to expand for their new product line. Yeah. How do you uh, like allow for this kind of thing to happen or not? OK, uh, one last question back there. Yep, go ahead, Jim. Thanks, I'm Jim. I'm a master's student here. How does this radically marketized system uh, deal with the problem of people not knowing what they want, not understanding their preferences, not having stable preferences that can be, that they can sort of express in a market and that a market can then meet? If the person's not rational, they don't have stable preferences, how do we sort of deal with that problem? Okay. So the information problem, yep. what's the steady state look like? And then another yeah. question about yeah. yes. right. yep. ability. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so first of all, this is not a utopian book. Uh, 
It is a reformist book. Um, and I think there are many anticipable problems that will emerge in this world and that would have to be addressed by future reforms. Um, for example, it doesn't deal with inequality in human capital. It only deals with inequality in wealth. And I think that can make a very large amount of progress, but then there will have to be things to address that other problem that would persist and probably become larger once uh, you know, there's no way to invest and achieve persistent wealth through investing in um, you know, physical capital. So uh, yes, I think just like the, say, New Deal type settlement, the settlement near the social democratic settlement in the West uh, in the middle part of the you know, 20th century, lasted and was incredibly successful for a while and then started to fray, the same would happen here. My hope is to build a architecture of experimentation that hopefully will continue to produce new ideas and that this is just the beginning of such a project and maybe the ideas that come out of that can help provide answers to those things and we're working on that very much. So that's why ideas and research is a critical part of this. Um, in terms of stability, the, the median household in the United States has $80,000 of net wealth, and the mean household has more than a million. So um, if people overvalued their assets by a factor of 10, they'd still receive a net social dividend under this system. Most people who got paid 10 times the market value for their house would be quite happy to sell. That is, if they own a house, which is not true of uh, many people in many of these countries who are already getting evicted all the time. Um, so I think that, in fact, what the system does is redistribute stability from the wealthy who are currently hoarding it to the broad population rather than undermining it. Um, and in terms of people's rationality and information, first of all, the system itself makes things far more transparent. Uh, a lot of the tr trouble in valuing a house is you don't know what comparable houses are worth. Everything would be open under this system. But beyond that, um, you know, the, the notion that people can't be trusted to make decisions for themselves, uh, I, I always have trouble understanding precisely what's meant. Like who does, who is able to make decisions for them? Someone has to make the decision. So is it you and a small elite that get to make the decision? Well, that doesn't sound right either. So I think what it really means is there's some amount of economies of scale and in information processing. But I don't think that's the whole world or Facebook that's best at doing it. I think probably it's some overlapping communities that would help you do that. And I think that those things with a good public good provision system would emerge from the society to help people figure out the best way to value their assets. Glenn, a lot of fresh and bold ideas in here. Uh, if we were to give you a year to abandon all of your commitments and work on one of them, which one would it be? Oh, I don't believe in focusing on the ideas as the way to slice this stuff up. I believe in building an overlapping, rich, diverse movement that connects the whole framework together. So uh, you know, the idea that's probably most long-term exciting to me is this liberal radicalism and so forth, but, but that's not the point. The point is actually the way in which they all work together. Fantastic. So um, in a moment, I'm going to invite you to uh, join me in thanking Glenn. But while, he, while we are doing that, he's going to sign this copy, which we will leave upstairs for our student library. Uh, the book is Radical Markets, and this is Glenn Wilde. Thank you. Thank you.